Hello and welcome to an event at the REACH at the Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts. Um, we are excited today to have um, Kenny and Clementine here to do a workshop titled Indigeneity on the Stage, where we will be learning more about being Indigenous and being a performer and, and how we um, can engage that within ourselves. So I'm very excited to um, introduce Kenny and Clementine. I'm gonna let you all introduce yourselves. Thanks, Emmy. Yeah. Okay, I'll go first. <laughs> Just <laughs> right into the camera. No, um, hello. Ah, my watch. Hakum and Yuea, and Yach Kenny Ramos, we chahi, and Yan Yuea, we eat chahi, Benegas, Nampum Welch, Kreshamak, Barona Indian Reservation, Kupai. My name is Kenny Ramos. I'm from the Barona Band of Mission Indians and the Kumeyaay Nation. I grew up on the Barona Indian Reservation. My family's are Benegas and Welch. And yes, I um, am a theater artist, and yeah, we'll be talking about theater today. I'm going to pass it over to Clementine. Hi, everyone. Uh, Clementine Bordeaux, Imachiapi. Uh, Wazia haha imataha na mini luzaha otumahe. I am Clementine and I am Sichango Galakota. I grew up on the Pine Ridge Reservation. I currently live in Rapid City, South Dakota. And yeah, um, I guess just to introduce further, we'll give a little bit of background about how we both got into theater. I'm more so on the like, community building administrative side now. But um, growing up on Pine Ridge, on the res, there wasn't a lot of theater. I remember the school I went to had a drama club and they would do theater. Um, but it was mostly just like, you know, mainstream plays or um, our attempts at Shakespeare, which were terrible. And uh, when I got to college, I really wanted to major in theater, but I often, especially as a brown person in a predominantly white theater space was regulated to like backstage. Um, and so I never really saw myself reflected on stage or in those stories that were told on stage. And so um, I kind of just fell away from theater until I moved to, sorry, my glasses keep fogging up. Um, until I moved to Los Angeles and I was working at the American Indian Studies program at UCLA and we were, Kenny and I were both staff at the time. Um, Kenny was actually the first student I graduated from American Indian Studies um, way back in, it was a long time, oh, it was a long decade long ago, ago now. Oh, oh, um, oh, oh, and yeah. so Kenny and I would go to community meetings. We got really involved in the um, different American Indian organizations in Los Angeles. And we were at a community meeting and there was Larissa Fasthorse and um, another cornerstone and a staff member from corner ensemble member from cornerstone named Sage. And they were like, we're doing this project with tribal communities in Los Angeles, both urban and the indigenous communities that are um, historically from the area. And um, so Kenny and I both with a theater background were like, yes, let's yeah. figure out how to help them. Um, and then we ended up both being community performers at the time for a production called Urban Res. And I think for both of us, that was a turning point. Mm -hmm. Probably Kenny more so, cause now like, right, we saw Kenny on stage <laughs> last night, amazingly. Um, but I think it was a turning point for both of us back to theater in a way that we, I don't think ever really imagined. Um, and just being able, and also, so we both have now become, you know, I sit on the board for Cornerstone Theater Company. Kenny is now an ensemble member. And I'll let Kenny share a little bit more about his story. I think is much more impactful than mine. Um, but I think in working with, a community-based theater who sees and understands community stories as central to creating amazing art mm -hmm. um, is what is really important to how we frame arts and culture and that collaboration between the two. And so part of like what we'll do, it's a small group today. We're hoping, you know, we always hope for more. Um, <laughs> I'm like... It's, yeah. the, it's the seats for the ancestors. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
so, but I think part of like what we'll do today is just this kind of demonstrate the process that we've become accustomed to, which is centering story and centering place and centering ourselves in relation to story and in relation to creative practice. And you don't have to be, you don't have to see yourself as an artist, but we all have stories to share. So that's part of um, what we will be demonstrating today is just how to think about our own stories as a place of starting um, these creative practices. Thank you. Thank you, Clementine. That was really great. Um, actually, yeah, fantastic tying it <laughs> together. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I guess I'll share a little bit about my story uh, and my journey in the theater. Um, Oh gosh, sorry. Oh, I see a person. I, I always can feel when I'm being like watched like in a fishbowl. Anyway, like, hi. <laughs> There's someone up there. Um, but yeah, I grew up, um, you know, on my reservation, the Brown Indian Reservation, which is in San Diego County. And there wasn't um, a lot of, I'm sorry, I'm, it's, I'm emotional already yeah, just because yeah. it's been a lot of, um, even when I was walking here today, I was emotional. Um, yeah, with um, not a lot of access to the art form. Um, and, you know, uh, but I really was a performative person as a kid and, and my family recognized that. And um, my dad put me in a, a theater program eventually when um, him and my mother divorced, which was really great because it was, it, it helped me and I got really into. Not the divorce, but the Right, yeah, the divorce was fantastic. Um, <laughs> No, but, um, the, but the theater program was great, although it was racist F, or AF, you know what I mean? It was, it was, it was, it was great in that I finally was able to do theater and, 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 and learn about it, um, but it was awful in that it was very Eurocentric theater, and it was white, racist, musical theater, and I was, um, like, kind of harmed as a, as a person playing these racist Indian stereotypical characters in some pl plays, like... Peter Pan that I had done several times, and Get Your Gun that I had done several times, and um, even my first show with that theater company it was Christian Youth Theater, which is its own thing with that all in it too. But was the was Pocahontas, and so there was very damaging things um, that I went through as a young person, just wanting to do theater as a young Native person. And then um, when I started, I started working professionally when I was eighteen. Um, I, I started doing uh, professional shows in the area, and um, I kind of was hiding who I was because I, my experience as a young person in that, um, as a young Native person, it felt like I couldn't be who, I couldn't be a Native person in the theater. There just didn't seem to be room for that. And so eventually when I went to college and I was at UCLA and I was in American Indian Studies and involved with the American Indian Student Association and going through so much um, kind of, transformation in terms of just critical thinking and, and understanding of myself and my history and my family and my community and, and, and working in the community, I kind of totally left theater behind because I, as I was reflecting, I realized just how, um, how all, like racist my experiences had been and how they had damaged me. And then, um, so six years had passed and I had, sorry, um, I had not done any theater at all and, but it was something that I really loved. And then, um, you know, I was at this community meeting with Clementine and Larissa's there and Cornerstone's there and they were like, oh yeah, we're doing this play. And, you know, we, we're a community engaged theater company. We make plays with and about communities and we want to do this, this play with, with your community. And it kind of, um, it was, it was a big turning point. Um, cause it just woke up that part of me that I had kind of, um, set aside for a long time. And I didn't know that um, there was space for that, for Native theater. Anyway, we did the play and it was um, transformative in so many ways, um, and for me personally, because it was my first um, theater experience where I got to play a contemporary truthful Native character that also told um, very truthful stories of our experiences as Native people in Los Angeles. That one was also specifically, you know, since it was in California, there was a lot of California Indian stuff and I'm a Californian. So it felt very, um, it felt very just empowering and impactful. 
And one of the things also that I loved about it is um, how the community responded to it. Um, you know, we had Tongva elders come and, and come to us crying, yeah. talking about how much this play that we had worked on that was based on stories in, in this area, in the Los Angeles basin, like was speaking to them and their experience in a way that other native theater that they may have seen at other places did not. And so that was really powerful for me. Um, it, was a, it was a paradigm shift of even seeing theater as, as, as what it is it, it, to me. It, it's, a, it's service, it's in service to community and, and um, there's so much power in it and what it can accomplish. But then, yeah, for me personally, it was a whole turning point in my career too because I left my position at UCLA and I went on this journey that I've been on now where I do theater for a living and, um, and that's really quite amazing and it's all, native theater projects, like I, very intentional. It's been six years. It's been, yeah, now it's like on the other end of this, I had six years of no theater whatsoever, and now it's been six years and I've received, I, I mean, I'm working in the theater. I was the first native to receive um, the, this fellowship, Theater Communications uh, Group Fox Foundation Fellowship, which um, was really integral. It kind of put me in a more formal relationship with Cornerstone, which led me to be into the ensemble, and now, um, me and Larissa and, and Clementine were working on our third collaboration, actually. That, that first play, Urban Res, was so successful, it sparked more interest, and we did a second version of it in, in Phoenix in partnership with um, ASU Gamage and the Center of Indian Education out there. And it was Urban Res, but on like steroids. It was huge. There was like 40 plus community members, and we did it at um, you know, Phoenix Indian School Park, and we did it on the uh, Salt River Pima Maricopa Indian Community Reservation. And, um, and now we're working on our third collaboration. Um, and yeah, and anyway, my life has been transformed by, by um, theater and this kind of work that we do at Cornerstone. And, um, and I just, I see so much value and power in it. And I want that for more of our people, more indigenous people, because there's just so much opportunity in it. And we are natural storytellers, um, you know, obviously our stories, like all of our communities have been passing down stories for generations. That's what we just did on this, this stage over here last night. We're sharing these stories and, um, and there's such a vibe, there's just so, there's a, there's opportunity in it for our people and I, I wanna share that. Anyway, I'm, take this away. I can't do anything anymore. <laughs> take this away. Take it away, because um, I'm just gonna start. Yeah. <laughs> you got your cry face on. Yes, I know, it's I so know. hard. Yeah, I just can't, I'm sorry, back, give it back. No, um, oh, just thinking like, I don't know, cause yeah, I mean, I just, I'm still processing what we just did at yeah. the Kennedy Center last night, which is crazy. Yeah. Um, yeah, and, but that's what we can accomplish yeah. in the theater and to fill that, yeah. yeah, and with native people, yeah. like um, in it with us, like in the audience and sharing that, that is um, just power to me, and yeah. Do what we got. Do it, and it's like take it away. Um, so yeah, I think part of right. I I feel like our Kanaka Mali relatives, right? I always talk about we talk story, right? We share story, and I think we were our Lakotas over here, um, Dakotas, and right. Part of we are always trying to find ways to connect with each other. And I think, right, if you're used to a historic white theater, right, it's a lot of, it's a drama on stage and often we may or may not connect with it. Um, and it is, like Kenny said, extremely whitewashing when we do see Native characters. It has been in shows like Annie Get Your Gun, um, Pocahontas, Peter Pan. If you've ever seen those productions, they are extremely racist. Um, and so it's how do we find ways to tell our stories? And I think the part that often gets left out is that um, we have been doing these types of things for a millennia, right? We've been telling stories in different ways, especially with our bodies. We probably won't make you all do exercises, but we could. <laughs> but I don't want to make you too uncomfortable. Um, but we'll, so we'll, a lot of what we've learned in how to, and the process I think that has been most impactful for me in working with an organization like Cornerstone, and Cornerstone's not the only theater company doing this, right? There's like Junebug mm -hmm. Productions um, in, I think they're located in New Orleans. Yeah. 
they do a similar method of storytelling. And so um, we're going to model a story circle. And so this is when we're building um, stories with and for communities um, in a place with a production company like Cornerstone. We're often going to communities where they don't see themselves on stage. So it's like, how do we get these stories out of the community that they want to tell, that they want to share? Um, so we'll model this process of a story circle. And um, and I know we're being recorded, so we're, we won't, if you're not comfortable talking on the mic, you don't have to. It's mostly for Kenny and I as presenters. But with the story circle is, we'll obviously go in a circle. Um, and we'll, pro we'll pose a question or a prompt. And so each person will answer the prompt and um, you can pass, you don't have to participate. But the point is to start generating stories. And a part of that is to be able to, A, like recognize we all have something to share, but also you might hear a story from someone you know that you've never heard before. Or you might connect if, there are, you know, strangers in the room that you're meeting for the first time, you might be able to connect then with a, something that they're sharing as well. And that's a part of this process of then being able to, to build a broader, larger story that then you could put on stage, right? So these are just the foundational storytelling that we do. Um, and I think is really vital, especially for Indigenous communities, is being able to share stories. And so um, we'll start with a simple one. <laughs> so if you just share your name and a story about your name, and it could be a simple story, it could be a long story. Um, and so I'll start and then we'll just, we'll go this way so then um, Kenny can model too. So as you know, as I shared before, my name is Clementine. Um, and my full name is actually Clementine Minnie Kathleen Bordeaux. Um, and I am named after great-grandparents. I always joke that I'm glad my parents were out of their hippie phase when I was born. and Because I have some friends on Pine Ridge that are like rainbow and wind and like... <laughs> <laughs> and I, I... But obviously in Lakota, but they, you know... Um, but I think like, I'm glad my parents were kind of out of that phase. Because um, then I got to be named after great-grandparents. Um, and I actually was, a lot of folks know me as Minnie, which is one of my middle names, um, because when I was born, I'm the youngest, uh, my sibling said that Clementine was too grown up for a baby. And so I was called Minnie, a majority of the beginning of my life. And now I feel like I have an identity crisis with every, <laughs> every iteration of my name. Um, but you, yes, I can be called Clementine or Minnie. Min or Clem, like I have all these iterations, but I think that also is a connection to like relational, right? Like what is the relationship that the person has with you and your name? Thank you. Um, my name is Kenneth Ray Ramos. That's my full name, my government name. Um, and yeah, my, my name, my, my mother and father were, they were actually gonna name me Anthony Ray um, or Ray Anthony, that's what it was going to be, Ray Anthony, and to call me Tony for short, um, which would have been nice, I think. And then my, my dad's name is actually Kenneth, and so it was really last minute that my mom, like, and they had already told people that that was going to be my name. <laughs> um, and then I was born, and my mom just had a last minute change of heart and named me Kenneth Ray instead, which my dad was like, why did you do that? I don't know why you did that. Um, so that's how I came to be named Kenneth Ray, but my dad goes by Ken, and I never, everyone, I don't know, just called me Kenny, and so I was, that's what people, that was, became my little nickname. Kenny Ray, I get Kenny Ray sometimes, um, but how my dad was named Kenneth is because my grandfather, my dad's father, um, his name was Con is Constantino Ramos, um, but people, I guess, didn't really know how to say it, so he has different nicknames, like Tang, or like, Tino, but um, for me, it's just grandpa. It's Gramps for me. But um, anyway, 
but I guess people had a hard time with that, probably white people, um, with Constantino. So sometimes he would say his name was Kenneth. Um, and so when, um, when it came to naming my father, my grandfather named him that name because that was just the name that he, he liked. And then Ray, Ray's kind of like a family name that is on both sides. Like I have an uncle Ray on my mom's side or on my dad's side. And then my, we have like a lot of Ray middle names on my mom's side. So I just got stuck with Ray. And that's that. Yeah. Stories of my name. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And wait, should we? Wait, you say, yeah. Oh, we have some folks joining. So um, if you can join us in the circle, <laughs> then we can, I'll re-explain so everyone can participate. Yeah. Oh my God, come on up on time. Thanks for talking all that time, Kenny. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I think I resonated a lot with that. Oh, yeah. Like, that's why I love music, because of all the things that you shared. Yeah, yeah. it's hard, yeah. I think. Yeah. Being Native and then loving art, and then, like, trying to find place in, in the Western art world or the American art yeah. stuff, and then it's so damaging, and then you end up leaving it. Mm -hmm. And then, but then that art is still so part of you. Right. Yeah. yeah. And how do you, like, the yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So thank you all for joining. Um, and this, so we're, the re, the recording, the microphone is for the camera. Um, so you all, we're gonna do a, we're doing a story circle right now. Um, I know some of you might be familiar with it. If not, we're basically um, providing a prompt and we all respond to the prompt, but you don't have to talk on the mic. I know that might be uncomfortable for some folks, but it's mostly for Kenny and I. Um, so what we started with is just uh, if you can introduce yourself and then share a story about your name. So I shared a story about, I'm called both Clementine and Minnie, so you can call me either one. Um, and Kenny shared a story about- like how I was even named that. Yeah, how he was named Kenneth Ray mm -hmm. um, last minute. He was supposed to be Tony, mm -hmm. which I did not know. I don't know if I ever heard that story. Right yeah, so we can call him Tony. Um, <laughs> but we'll we'll continue around on the circles. So if you would like to share, you don't have to share on the mic. It's up to you. Um, you can. Sure. Okay. Velina mai me kia loha ya kako apau o vaoneke ia o ikai komendes he kama kola ola ono ka aina nui ya Hawaii um, kama kupuni o Maui. Uh, Aloha, my name is, um, my full name, since we're going on names, is Brennan Joshua Ikaika Mendez. Um, but I just go by Ikaika or Ika for short. Um, so a story on my name is that my first name, um, the colonizer name, Brennan, starts with a B because everyone in my family, everyone, on, like, starts with a B. Like, it's crazy. There's like, all my cousins, yeah, it's kind of crazy. So, <laughs> Filipino, that's why we're Filipino as well. Um, so that's that's my name on, um, I mean, a little mo'olalo or story on Brennan. Um, there's really no significance in why they chose that name other than it starts with a B and nobody else had it in the family. <laughs> and, um, uh, and then I have a biblical name, Joshua, and my parents, um, who are very strong in the Christian faith, have um, named me after Joshua in the Bible who led um, after Moses and led people because they, they wanted me to grow up um, being a leader and um, leading our people. And to me, growing up, I learned in the biblical sense, but um, now looking back at my life and looking at my journey now and um, at the University of Hawaii, I see it as leading my, my native people and being that, that that leader for um, the people of my generation and after. And then we get to my name, Ikaika, and that means strong or strength. And when you break it apart, um, Ika, Ika, and then Ika, Ika. So Ika, Ika. So it's Ika, Ika, but then pronounced Ikaika. Um, and Ika means um, like unbreakable and like, like strong and um, firm and I am only like five foot 
five. <laughs> so like when people are like, your name is Ikaika? <laughs> I'm like, yes, I'm Ikaika, okay. Um, but uh, looking at my name and um, putting it into context with my journey and um, yeah, I kind of found my the meaning of that name within my life and it's more of a um strength in in voice and strength in um in um faith and just um resilience for for our indigenous people and for our kanaka maoli in hawaii um and standing up for what is right and being strong in that sense um and my last name mendez is goes back to the Philippines and um, the Spanish um, colonization and all of that stuff. Um, but yeah, so you guys can just call me Ikaika and that's um, Mo'olelo on my name. Yeah, mahalo. Okay, and then I'll get this. Thank you. Yat a. Se bajna bans, ta se janido, kachine e yana se, ki ya ane e bashas chain, uh, the uh, Mexican clans are my father's side. Sheeya Bajnaba. My name is Bajnaba. It's a Navajo name, but I also have a biblical name, Ruth, my government name. <laughs> and so um, after I retired as a nurse, seven years ago, I think. I uh, started taking photos. I'd always been a photographer, but I loved it. But anyway, my name was given to me my, by my grandma, and Bajnaba means she arrived, or she's arriving. So I'm not sure where I'm supposed to arrive at, maybe here, I don't know. But uh, it's a warrior name, so all the women are Ba's, they end with Ba. Uh, men have different names, of course. So I am a she arrived warrior. Ahiaha. She only got to go stay that would on the gilo hitigi on we, a chichalagi a lechi marmaskit. Hi, everyone. My name is Gostai in Cherokee, and my government name is Mark William Garcia, uh, Tiburon Garcia. And um, my go I'll start with my English name first. <laughs> and uh, I was named after my uncle, uh, my mother's brother, and that she. His name is Mark, and there's lots of marks in our family. There's like five. Um, and she, so she named me after him because he's a very good person. He's also very creative and very intelligent. And she wanted me to have his attributes, but to differentiate him, me from him and the other Marks, I'm Mark William. Um, my middle name, Tiburon, <laughs> um, it means shark in Spanish, um, <laughs> uh, and it's because when I was a baby and I was breastfeeding, she said that I would latch on like a shark. <laughs> and so I have that with me. And then my last name, Garcia, is my uh, father's name. And that's just for ease, ease of uh, naming. We just kept it, I guess. And then my Cherokee name, Gostai, uh, it means sharp, um, and they. I was given that name by our council at our stomp grounds, and I'm not. I haven't really figured out what sharp. It, it's not. It doesn't have the same. Uh, what is that word? Connotations like in English. There's the connotation sharp with also being intelligent. I'm not sure if that. I don't think there has that connotation in Cherokee. Um, so I'm still trying to figure figure that out. Wow, what's that? Nui dai da wuto ani ani gilohi di giawi chigi duagi naule chichalagi naule chimara mesquit. My name is in English Mora Michelle 
Oh, wow, this is complicated, right? Uh, well, okay, in Cherokee, my name is Nui Dai. And then in English, I've had names Mora, Michelle, Little, and Garcia. So I guess I'll start in order. Um, my birth name is Mora Michelle Little. Um, my mother, uh, I don't really know why she chose that, but she said for several things, um, with the Spanish invaded, I'm sorry, the, the Moors from Northern Africa invaded Spain um, and had an, you know, an empire there. And Mora is one way to say woman of the Moors or, or dark lady or something like that. So she, um, she, I don't know if she, later on she was like, oh, you remind me of an Arab person. I, but I don't think she knew that. But she, <laughs> she named me that name. Um, and then also uh, Mora is another version of the Virgin Mary, that name. Um, Michelle, I have no clue. Uh, we got several generations here, so maybe he, my daddy knows. I don't, I don't know, but I don't know where that came from. And Little is the name uh, of the, it's my father's, 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 father's name, um, a white landowner, a slave owner, a slave owner who owned one of my great, great, great grandfathers. That was his father. And so that's where that name Little comes from. And as far as I know, it can be traced back to Northern England. Um, and so like on the border of like Scotland and England, that's where that Little comes from. Um, then later, I, sorry, taking so long. I got the name Garcia. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, I got the name Garcia because I was very briefly married uh, to the, um, your sp sperm donor, and the name Garcia came uh, from, from Spain, it's a common Spanish last name, um, and I just kept it because I didn't want us to have different last names, because people, people treat you different, you know, I was like, oh, it'd be easy if we just keep Garcia, and so I've been more Michelle Garcia ever since, and then, um, I had a Cherokee nickname for a long time, which was Naisa. It was given to me by um, Grandma Chopper Chigesa, one of our family friend's mothers, uh, who just, she just looked at me and she was like, Naisa. And because uh, it doesn't mean anything in Cherokee, it's like a nickname. But I reminded her of her grandma auntie when she was growing up, who was a nice lady, and she gave me that name. And then later on, um, I was given ceremonial names, so like my grown person name, around the fire at Gatio at Stomp Dance. And the, uh, my name Nui Dai is a, it's an old name, doesn't have direct translation, but it translates loosely to good medicine is being made. And, um, you know, I come from line of medicine workers, both on my father's side, my great grandma on my father's side, and on my great grandma on my mother's side. So, Hawa Chisquata. Shade Keys Little uh, Junior, actually. It's not going to make any noise. It's just for recording. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, I was wondering. <laughs> yeah, it's not going to make noise. I could see you looking around for the speakers. Well, oh, I might be just looking around. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, uh, I only have, you know, uh, English names. I've uh, got a ways to go. Okay, so there's something to look forward to. Uh, Shade, uh, I'm a junior, so that's my daddy's name also. And before him, uh, his f grandfather was a, a Shadrach, uh, which is a name from the Old Testament, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And so that's probably what they did was chop it off some and do that. Uh, so, uh, but uh, uh, Little was the one more talked about. Uh, that was um, a band that came into the area called Noah Little, actually. So, uh, and he's the one, well, she's traced it back maybe, uh, but nobody knows that much about him. Uh, the Keys was my uh, father's uh, mother's maiden name. So 
Uh, and they had been in our area a long time, in North Carolina, uh, in this Imagine Ski, is that right? Uh -huh. Keys group. Keys spelled all kinds of different ways and that kind of thing. Uh, but that's uh, how I keep that. I, I, when I grew up, I used to just call myself Shade Little, but uh, there was a time, I don't know why, I just thought make sure I put the keys in there, that I, uh, you know, kept it in there. And um, what? Yes, I want to say. Oh, by her name. Uh, I think I remember me and my wife talking about stuff. She will say that she talked completely about it with me, and I agreed. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I go along with whatever she says. But I, but I remember us uh, looking at more more Tania, the whole area there, and about it meaning. Uh, you know, a, a dark uh, child, a dark, you know, person. And we like the, the sound of the name as much as anything, I think. Uh, and so, and like more, I don't know where Michelle came from, except that <laughs> the mom, her mama probably liked that name, <laughs> the sound of it, and that kind of thing. So, yeah, uh, we didn't, yeah, that's it. That's enough. Um, my name is Colby Hoklepkowski. Um, I don't have real meaning behind my name. I come from a very large family on my grandmother and my grandfather's side. And so there, if you, you'll find within my family that we don't like to recycle names. Everybody has their own name. That's kind of how like my grandma always did it. Even her, they have unique names. Uh, my grandmother's name was Elnita. Yes, and so even her child, her children, um, she, one of her youngest boys, and my grandpa's name was Melvin. He was a, a white guy, um, and he wanted a junior, and she refused it. She was like, "No, everybody deserves their own name." She was very adamant about it, and so his name was just cut short, Mel. Mel. Um, and my name, Colby, um, we just had this discussion earlier this morning with some other people, and I'm actually, it's a cowboy's name. My mom heard it when she was younger, living in Montana, and um, his name was Colby Long Soldier, and she just really liked the name, and she always knew she wanted to have a child with that name, and here I am. <laughs> I'm the youngest girl. I have a younger brother. He's the exception. My father did want his name carried on, but he's not a junior. He has a different middle name. And Lepkowski, my dad is Polish, so, and he's from Wisconsin, and that's where I get that one from. Yeah, we're big Packer fans. <laughs> So um, I'm trying to think what else, but yeah, so that's, I mean, you'll find very rarely within my family that there is a name reused, but like I said, my grandmother was very adamant about not reusing names. Everybody should have their own. There's middle names that have been reused. Um, my grandfather, which, well, I knew him as my grandfather. Um, my mother's father, uh, his name was Clifford. His name was reused. But if anybody's name is reused, we've um, always gone to that other person to ask permission. So my mother's birth father, his name was Clifford. But my grandpa, who I know as my grandpa, Melvin, raised all of them. She remarried and had more children. And his middle name, I'm kind of getting off track here, but it's real unique, is McHugh. And so that name, there's um, there's only three grandchildren who hold that name. And it was asked for permission before the child was even named. So, I mean, that's just kind of how we all have been, I guess. But yeah, that's my name. <laughs> my family is the opposite. We love reusing names. Um, <laughs> I, my name is, my legal name is Lorna Emily Hermeni Horses. 
Um, however, in my family, they love to give nicknames, and they're always nicknames that you wouldn't want to have in adulthood. Um, so, like, I have an aunt and a sister who both have baby as a part of their name, and that's what everyone calls them. And my mom was like, that is not happening. Um, so I was named after my grandma Lorna and my great grandma Emily, both of whom, um, my grandma Lorna is still alive and my great grandma Emily was alive when I was a child um, or a baby. And so I would have ended up with a nickname that my mom was not okay with. Um, and like they called me Sissy for a long time and my mom was trying to shut that down. Um, <laughs> So then they tried to pick a nickname out of one of my names and they called me Emma for like the first month of my life. And then uh, my dad decided he didn't like somebody named Emma. So I could not be Emma anymore. <laughs> and so um, they changed that. And so now everyone calls me Emmy out of the Emily um, because otherwise I would have been baby Lorna. Like I have a cousin who is in his mid twenties and he is baby Ed. Um, I have an uncle who I learned this week how to say his first name because I didn't know because we call him Tiny. He's my <laughs> uncle Tiny, and that's his name. And I have an auntie baby girl, and my sister's name is Baby. And that's just how it is. But my mom was like, no way, that's not happening. So um, now I'm Emmy, and I do not feel like a Lorna. That is my grandma. I am Emmy down in my soul. But on paper, I understand that, that that's what exists and in my heart I am Emmy. <laughs> Can I just say one thing? I call my niece Sissy Baby and I'm like, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> Sissy Baby. Sissy Baby. Sissy Baby. Sissy Baby. Sissy Baby. I like the Sissy Baby. Yeah. Um so we'll do I know we're we we have about 10 minutes, so we're going to do another round, and I, I will, we, we won't start, we'll let somebody else start, um, but which one should we do? Please? Uh, please. Please? Do you want to? I don't remember. I don't either. We could come up with. Was it? Um, or maybe you start. Do you want to talk about place or impact? Oh, go ahead. So I we were I was unsure if we, everyone in the workshop will ha, would have attended last night. Oh. So I think one thing that I would love to hear as we like situate ourselves um, with everything that's happening this weekend, and also the and it could be either or, right? Because I think thinking about the plate, the one thing that I or maybe I'll just start. So one thing that I've been really <laughs> struggling with is being here in the capital and being extremely angry. Um, but then the impact I think of last night's performance. And so um, I think you, if you either want to, I think it would be for me really thoughtful to hear about one moment in last night's show that made an impact on you. Um, and for me, it's right. Like the, idea of place because I'm always thinking about place and land and like what is on top of the land that is not thinking about the land right but so last night I think one for me um seeing all of the people from the Ocheti Shakoi on stage and just the the moment of the image of the Supreme Court and then all of those beautiful indigenous people standing so strong um, right, because I think our stories are often erased and being in this place <laughs> where all these decisions are made about our lives when they have never met us, they've never seen our land, they've never interacted with our ceremonies, right? Like all of this disconnect that's happening um, and having to deal with that kind of violence versus then seeing that that image I think was one of the most impactful for me um and just being so proud of all the performers um but yeah that's like that so just if you're able to I think of thinking about right as we 
imagine ourselves on stage or in these performance spaces, like what has made an impact for you. Um, and for me, it was that moment really stood out to me last night. Anyone? Yeah, we can. Um, I think for me, it's, I feel like I'm, I feel like I used to be an artist or used to want to be an artist but that's not who I am anymore because of like the story that you told and wanting to do theater and wanting to sing and wanting to do like opera performance type of stuff and, and the, how much that hurt um, to not feel safe in those spaces, to not be able to be myself in those spaces and to have lots of ideas placed on me by white people was so harmful and toxic and made me stop singing for years. Like at all, even just like in my bedroom, nothing. And seeing a stage at a place like the Kennedy Center full of native people and people who grew up like on the res, <laughs> is so, no, I'm gonna start crying. Um, it's just such a big deal because we have, we had a place in the Kennedy Center and I would have never imagined something like that, especially with what the show was and what it talked about and what it brought up from our communities. That's not how places like the Kennedy Center, it feels like we would be welcomed. And this, the, those don't feel like the stories that we'd be allowed to tell. And so, like I just keep thinking back to that and I, I wonder what that would have done for the younger me that wanted to be in spaces like that. And so, like, just being able to be there last night and, and see that and then experience it fully. Um, I hope that it, I hope that if there's a future version of the person I wanted to be when I was younger, feels like they belong in those spaces because of the show that you shared last night. So if I cry, I've been holding it in since last night. <laughs> like, just from the beginning, just right out of the gate when the guy was like, think of all the people we've lost in the last year. I lost my grandma in the last year. But everything else, um, I totally agree with what Min and Emmy had said. Um, it was just so powerful. And the younger you, um, I didn't really grow up on the res, but around the res. I lived in a border town, so we had this discussion last night. Um, and I guess it's kind of hurtful to somebody. Um, I'm considered a passer because I can pass in the white world. They don't really see me as indigenous. And it was true. Um, I did really well, and um, it was actually when I went to the native school where I didn't do so well. Um, I wasn't accepted there. I was too white for them. So it was a lot, but it's okay now. But last night it was just beautiful and amazing to see all of that. So, yeah, it was, yeah. Uh, I did spend a lot of time trying to uh, get in with the spirit of uh, forgiveness and love. Uh, still working on it, <laughs> not quite there. Uh, but uh, I was really, uh, 
love the whole uh, span, uh, the, uh, the, the what I don't usually see on the stage, uh, the, the melanin difference, you know, all across the span, uh, the size differences, uh, the age differences, although. Uh, the way they moved, I'm not sure. Some of the gray was uh, not painted on, but uh, I, I took it as it was. Yeah, especially the uh, the woman, uh, the jingle dancer, uh, the one that hollered, yeah, every now and then. You know, yeah. I, I'm gonna propose to her sometime. Oh. oh, oh my God! Oh. I didn't know that. Cute <laughs> <laughs> today, big things. Yeah, no, 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 no. She, 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 she's probably got to get a little older. <laughs> she, <laughs> but I, okay, I'm taking wrong. that away. <laughs> Give me that. No, <laughs> I don't even know what to say now. Um, <laughs> oh, um, so I think, uh, I don't know if we even said, we're from land now called North Carolina. And I've been all over. I'm a performer. I've been able to perform in many places and, and gatherings with different Native people, seeing Native theater, Native dance. But at these gatherings, like as Southeastern people, um, the realities of the, I always tell people like our wounded knees were happening in the 1600s and the 1700s and nobody, like people don't know about them. They don't talk about them. Um, they don't talk about the slavery. They don't talk about the one drop rule. They don't talk about the disenfranchisement of our communities through color laws. And so often I'm the only one Southeastern person and I don't feel that we're seen. So I think so one of the most beautiful things to me that Yuli was at the top, that Tuscarora, North Carolina, erased, was at the top. Um, so we're related to Tuscarora. Madame Mesquite, we fought with them in the Tuscarora War back in the day, and our homelands are close together. And Cherokee, Tuscarora, and Cherokee, our languages are related. So to me, they're our cousins, you know, they're really close to both of my uh, tribes. And that it started with Tuscarora, with Lumbee. Lumbee don't have... Tuscarora have no recognition, Lumbee only have state. So that they were in center stage and our stories were so prominently shared as Southeastern peoples, you know, that just um, made me so happy. So I think just that moment. And then the second moment was, I was trying not to cry, but when, when Hawaii, people from Hawaii came out, oh, it was over, <laughs> you know? Uh, I think maybe, I was just, the m most impactful part, then this feels like kind of a cop-out, um, was the entire thing, just because I don't think I've seen that, like, wit a breadth of, like, different peoples from everywhere, like, on one stage, working together to make a cohesive piece of art. And it was just really beautiful to see everyone and many different stories from many different tribes who you don't always hear about um, just being told and being centered. Uh, I kakao and like relate to kind of everything that was just said. Um, and one thing that I noticed last night was um, there's a saying in Hawaiian that goes, uh, Ike iake kanaka i kana kana olalo kana kana hula, and a person is seen through his language and through his dance, and that's exactly what I saw last night. I saw um, all of our unique traditions and our cultures and um, instruments and all of that. But the thing that really brought us together and the thing that um, that kind of made us the same was our voice, it all included our voice mm -hmm. and everything was centered around um, what that instrument does for our cultures. And um, I remember one of my, my tutu or my, my grandmas, she said that um, your, our voice was our first instrument in our culture, our voice. And that's what, I can't stop thinking about that, especially last night and I'm dissecting what we did over this trip and we went to different museums 
and seen, we saw this beautiful Hawaiian feather cape in the um, National Museum of Natural History. And we did a chant. And immediately when we started chanting, lights were flickering and everything. And you could just feel the, the, um, the power in um, when one of our coworkers, she started doing her part of the chant, it just like got dark and then it started like just blinking and everything. And um, you can tell that like our ancestors and our, our, our culture, that symbol of our culture, they react to our voice. And same thing to um, the Easter Island Moai that we saw um, because that's our, our cousins of the Pacific. Um, we did a chant for and played a song for, for the Moai. And at the same time, it was, there was like a rumble and there was like just heaviness that just fell upon everybody that was at the museum at the, like around us. And it's all because of our voice. And that's definitely something as a music student, um, I appreciate from last night was how our voices were so unique, but brought us together and all that. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Thank you. That was beautiful. Oh, the voice. Oh yeah, I'm still processing. I thank you everyone for sharing so much. Um, I can't even begin to think what, um, what, what one thing for the experience would be for me. Um, but I think ultimately it was being able to share with in space with so many native people in the audience. I love the, the exchange in theater and how it's done in relationship to people and we, sh we share it together, like not just those performing, but like with people that we're performing in relationship with and to have so many native people um, wit witness it um, in person and then also streaming actually it like there were so many people across Indian country watching and I didn't even know and but I'm getting people tagging and, um, so for me the, that that is I guess the impact for me is um, all these beautiful things where everyone said like so many native people from so many places telling our stories using our voices in this place of all places uh, and for it to finally um you know, come and be shared and be received um, and to be a part of that. It's a big, um, that was it back to head on me. And to hear a baby out there, like, or to hear young ones. Um, so knowing that that could have an effect um, moving forward. Uh, take it away. <laughs> So um, we're at time. Thank you for joining us at the end. Sorry we couldn't loop you in. Um, I just, but thank you all for sharing. I think part of what I was hoping, we were hoping, it's also that reflection, right? So, um, you know, we only had an hour here today, 45 minutes to be able to try to talk about like the importance of having indigeneity on the stage. But um, I really appreciate you all sharing and listening. And I think that's a part of, uh, hopefully what we carry on from this weekend so i really i really thank you all and yeah let me up be thank you yeah. thank you